Professor Bridges, you said several times, you've used a phrase, I want to make sure I understand what you mean by it. You've referred to people with a capacity for pregnancy. It, would that be women? Many women, cis women, have the capacity for pregnancy. Many cis women do not have the capacity for pregnancy. Um, there are also trans men who are capable of pregnancy, as well as non-binary people who are capable of pregnancy. So this isn't really a women's rights issue. It's a, it's, we can it's recognize a that this impacts women while also recognizing that it impacts other groups. Those things are not mutually exclusive, Senator Hawley. Oh, so your view is, is that the core of this, this right then is about what? So um, I want to recognize that your line of questioning um, is transphobic, <laughs> um, and it opens up trans people to violence by not recognizing that. Wow, you're saying that I'm opening up people to violence by asking whether or not women are the folks who can have pregnancies? So I'm one, I want to note that one out of five transgender uh, persons have attempted suicide. So I think it's important Because of my line of questioning? Because so we can't talk about it? Because denying that trans people exist and pretending not to know that they exist I'm is denying dangerous. that trans people exist by asking Are you? you if you're talking Are you? about women Are you? having pregnancies. Do you believe that there, uh, men can get pregnant? No, I don't think women can <laughs> so get pregnant. So you are denying that trans people exist? Thank and that leads to violence? Is this how you run your classroom? Are students allowed to question you? Absolutely. Or are they also treated like this? Where no, you, no, no, they're, they're told that to they're at, opening up people to oh, violence We have a good time in my class. You should join. Oh, I bet. You might learn a lot. Wow, I, I would learn a lot. I've learned a you, lot just I know. in this exchange. Absolutely. Extraordinary. Yep. Um, that was amazing. So for those of you who don't know, that was Kiara Bridges. She is University of California professor of law, and she was shutting down Senator Josh Hawley's transphobic line of questioning during a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing. And my favorite part was when she said, you should join one of my classes. You might learn a lot. She said this to a U.S. senator like a boss. That's perfect. That's what you have to do. These people they do not deserve our respect. And you can tell that Josh Hawley was trying to be patronizing. He was smugly trying to own her, but she didn't back down. And she's correct. Now, one thing that irritates me about these anti-woke politicians and anti-woke broadcasters is that they oftentimes will talk about the uh, woke PC police trying to tone police other people. But was Kiara Bridges there tone policing anyone? Was she correcting Josh Hawley and said, no, 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 it's not women, it's people with the capacity for pregnancy. No, she was just trying to be more inclusive and more factual, to be honest. But she wasn't tone policing. But here you have Josh Hawley seemingly offended that she was using more inclusive language and trying to tone police her. So who's the real tone policers? Is it the woke people or is it the anti-woke people? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Now, what I want from people to do, the takeaway from this, is to be like Kiara Bridges. Don't just be a passive ally. Actually confront this type of transphobia. Actually stand up for marginalized people. Because as an ally, if we're just passively supporting, we do nothing to advance their cause. But if we actually vocalize our support for them and defend them when need be, that's what actually helps them solidify not just their rights, but security in the United States, which trans people desperately need currently. Now, why was Kiara Bridges there? Well, as Alex Bollinger of LGBTQ Nation explains, Bridges was testifying at a committee hearing about the legal consequences of the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, a decision that overturned Roe v. Wade and ended the federal right to an abortion in the United States. So that moment went viral for obvious reasons. It was really nice to see her shut down a transphobic senator, but there are other portions from her testimony that I think were really important and worth sharing. So that's what I want to do. So I want to share a response that she gave to a question asked by Cory Booker. And the point that he was making here was also really important. But she said something that I hadn't previously thought about that really invalidates the argument that Republicans are pushing to kind of make people feel better about this, this uh, whole abortion being returned to the state's issue. Take a look. I've been looking at just data and seeing that states that provide a great access to contraception, free access to contraception, actually lower rates of unwanted pregnancies, like Colorado, lower rates of abortion by empowering women and low-income women in particular. I, in, the, in the dissent uh, of the Dobbs case, they pointed out what to me was absurd the reality that many of the states moving to create the most restrictive bans on abortion are the very states that aren't doing the things that are obvious to lower the rates of maternal death 
like expanding Medicaid. And, and, and so this argument that they value life by not providing access to contraception, by not expanding Medicaid, their states have some of the worst records for women dying in pregnancy-related causes. It seems rank hypocrisy to me, and especially as it affects African-American women who die three times more. And I was wondering if you just maybe, Dr. Nichols, and Dr. Bridges could just as cogently as possible in the limited time I have left, can you just talk about how these bans in the name of life are actually causing so much more death uh, in communities, especially for the most vulnerable women? Um, I'm just gonna take 30 seconds and then I'll pass it to you. Um, thank you so much for that question. I wanna also point out that the states that are passing the most restrictive uh, laws around abortion are also the states that are preventing people from voting. Um, Senator Lee, Senator Cruz have talked about Oh, this decision just to turn this uh, Dobbs decision just returns it to the the elected representatives of states to, and people can battle it out in these laboratories of democracy as to whether they want to protect fetal life over the interests of of the pregnant person. These are the same states that are stopping people from voting. Texas has the most restrictive voting laws on the books. Texas's SB8 doesn't represent the will of the majority of Texans. Texas SB8 represents the will of the majority of Texans that were able to vote. So in order for this to be a democracy, we have to protect voting rights. And I, I leave it to um, everyone in this, in this room, as well as the rest of Congress, to protect voting rights so that we can be a real democracy. That is such an important point that she made, and I haven't heard anyone talk about it in this manner. I don't believe it's acceptable to strip women of their right to make decisions about their own bodies. Even if we had a functioning democracy, I don't believe in this prospect or this concept, rather, of states rightsing away all of our civil rights and civil liberties. That being said, we don't even have a functioning democracy. The states where they're outlawing abortion are also the same states that impose harsh restrictions on voting. And as Cory Booker pointed out, they have the highest rates of maternal mortality. So if these states actually were serious about giving the people a say... If these Republicans were serious about protecting, you know, uh, life, wouldn't they try to do something to address the high rates of maternal mortality in their states? Well, no, because they are hypocrites and they don't care. This is all about controlling women. They don't care about bodily autonomy. Pro-lifers, supposed pro-lifers, really forced birthers, but, you know, these pro-lifers, they never suggest that we should uh, be forced to donate blood be forced to donate organs even when you're dead and you're no longer using your body they don't mandate that you give those organs to people to save lives you have to at the dmv say i want to become an organ donor so if we truly valued life wouldn't there be these other steps that they take i mean it's it's a joke and honestly i'm to the point where i don't even want to engage with this pro-life argument because they are demonstrably anti-life because when you outlaw abortion that is a pro-death position you're subjecting women to unsafe and illegal abortions that could threaten their lives and that's what professor bridges was pointing out here now in a different portion um she was asked by john cornyn a question and he was very clearly trying to do this gotcha game with her but as you're going to see she doesn't take the bait. She doesn't play along with his semantic game. She doesn't play along with what he wants her to uh, respond to. Take a look. Do you think that a, um, a baby that is not yet born has value? I believe that a person with a capacity for pregnancy has value. They have intelligence. They have agency. They no, have I'm dignity. talking about the baby. And I'm talking about the person with the capacity for and pregnancy. And you're not answering the question. I'm asking. I'm, you I'm, think answer that a, I'm answering you, a more interesting you think question that, to you me. You think that the baby that is not yet born, let's say the day before this mother delivers, do you think that baby has value? I think that the person with the capacity for pregnancy has value and they, have the, they should have the ability to control what happens to their lives. Well, and, and I just note you refuse to answer the question. That's how it's done, folks. That is how it's done. You don't have to play their games. You don't have to answer their bogus lines of questioning because these are people who are not serious. They're not living in reality. When conservatives uh, visualize women having abortions, they visualize a woman that's like eight, eight months pregnant 
who just on a whim decides to go get an abortion. But if you actually look at data for abortions by gestational age, the overwhelming majority of abortions occur within the first 10 to 12 weeks of pregnancy. So we're not talking about babies. We're talking about zygotes. We're talking about clumps of cells. So if someone is eight months pregnant, they want that baby. They're not just going to flippantly have an abortion because they had a change of heart, right? Abortions are necessary because if you have an abortion at that point in the pregnancy, well, then that means either the life of the pregnant person is at risk, the fetus is non-viable, or they had a miscarriage and an abortion is needed to remove said dead fetus. So, you know, Republicans, they have to lie and obfuscate because they don't actually have an argument. They have to try to cultivate sympathy illogically so in order to control women, in order to control people and what they do with their own bodies. And it's unacceptable. Now, one more clip that I want to play for you features Kiara answering a question from Chris Coons about what other rights could be stripped away. Now, this isn't necessarily surprising, but because she is a law professor, I think that her expertise here is necessary. And this is a warning. More rights are going to be stripped away because of the rationale that the Supreme Court used to overturn Roe v. Wade. Let's watch. What other fundamental rights might reasonably be imagined to be at risk? Right. So looking to the nation's history, um, whether that, you know, date is 1787 when the Constitution was ratified, 1789 when the Bill of Rights was ratified, um, or 1868 when the 14th Amendment was ratified, is to look at periods of the nation's histories um, in which marginalized populations today were completely erased. Um, so I can talk about the LGBTQ community. Um, they were not contemplated by, by the framers, by those who ratified the Constitution, their ability to live lives that are have dignity, um, their ability to love who they who they love and to marry who they marry, um, that just wasn't contemplated contemplated by those folks who ratified the Constitution. Um, people of color, immigrant, um, people, uh, people with disabilities, uh, people with the capacity for pregnancy, right? All of those groups were not simply um, thought of and their interests were not um, considered um, during that moment in the nation's history. So I can l tell you the litany of cases that we ought to be wary about being reversed. Obergefell versus Hodges, Lawrence versus Texas, um, Loving versus Virginia, Skinner what's versus Oklahoma. Thread? Professor, what's the common thread across all those cases? Some some folks who are watching may not know as much as right. you do about the specifics of what kinds of freedoms are protected by We're that talking whole about cases. the the court framed um, these these cases the link that links them is this using the liberty term of the due process clause to recognize that people need the capacity to make decisions about their their personal lives about whether they create a family about how they raise their family um, about decisions regarding love and sex and marriage and and so to pull Whole row out of that thread of cases that have all recognized um, the, the right to privacy and liberty interests um, is to cr create um, an, uh, uh, chaos and create uncertainty with regard to the cases that came after, and that's Lawrence versus Texas protecting same-sex contact, um, same-sex marriage, as well as the cases that came before. Thank you, Professor. That's an insightful comment on how much else is at risk here and why this impacts um, fundamental rights that we've, many of us, millions of us, come to rely on to make decisions about our own life, about our families, about uh, who we love, how we love, um, and when and how we um, choose to have children. Yes, Senator Coons, isn't it frightening? I mean, it's almost like your party should take extreme action to rein in this rogue Supreme Court before they strip us of more civil rights and civil liberties. But really, he's not the focus. Kiara is the focus, and everything that she said there it's what we've been hearing from legal experts. So she's just reinforcing what we already know, but I still think it's important to hear from experts. They're saying, look, all of these civil rights and civil liberties that were won through the Supreme Court because of the due process clause, they are in danger. So this is a warning sign to Democrats, to people in power. If you want to stop this su Supreme Court who's gone rogue, from taking away more rights, you can't just sit here and complain when it happens. You actually have to take action. You have to pack the Supreme Court, institute judicial ethics that would lead to impeachment of the Supreme Court justices who lied to get confirmed, of the Supreme Court justices like Clarence Thomas, who wouldn't recuse himself in a case related to January 6th, which implicates his wife, Ginny Thomas. You could pack the Supreme Court. You can't just sit here 
and let them take rights away from us. And if you're Joe Biden, warn us that gay marriage is next. Warn us that they're going to do more harm to us. If you have power, you have to act. You have to wield that power. So that's all that I have. I, I think that Kiara Bridges is an amazing person. And to see her shut down all of these senators, put them to shame, was really uh, satisfying to watch. So, um, yeah, shout out to Kiara Bridges. I absolutely love what she's saying. She is um, a treasure.